Turn to Malachi this morning. Okay, we're, we'll take wagers. Who wants to wager on what, what I'm teaching on? Who? That's this. That's what I think you'd say. You're wrong, but hallelujah. Malachi is the, the Italian prophet. Uh, who, who says that? Who I heard that from? But. Um, you know, it's interesting scripturally, and I know, uh, I, I know it's not hard to believe, but it, it, it is crazy how accurate the Word of God is. Um, I, I'm reminded of back when uh, Yangi Cho sat down with uh, one of the leading neurosurgeons in the world, and um, and uh, the used to having dinner with him or lunch with him, and, and the neurosurgeon said something on the order of. He said, we have found some fascinating things in the, uh, in the area of the brain. And we have found that um, if, if whatever the mouth says, uh, the mouth is the captain of the whole body. And if the mouth speaks, the rest of the body will come to attention and will obey whatever the mouth says. And, uh, and he said, we are, we, are, we are fascinated by this finding. And Yang Cho is totally unimpressed and goes, yes, I knew that. And he goes, how can you know that? We're just finding out. He goes, it's in the Bible. The Bible said it a long time ago that, it, you know, that what, what comes out of your mouth is what your, your body will yield to. But that's the way the Word of God is. Whether it be your health, whether it be your finances, whether it just be your family, um, it's, it's in there and it's accurate. Um, prophetically, it, it's, it's amazing. Uh, the... the, uh, the the accuracy of, of, of the prophets. And we're not talking about, you know, standing in the middle of it going, I prophesy things are going to get bad. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's, it's hundreds and thousands of years previously prophesying what would come in the end times. And in the, in the book of Malachi, it literally says here in, in chapter 4, it's the reason I did it like I did it, because... Wanted some of you to just to feel really bad about yourself. Just kidding. <laughs> but in chapter four, um, verse, we'll start with verse five because it gives us the time period. It says, "Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord." So it's it's talking about the days we're living in now. It's talking about these end times, and it says, "And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children." to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. In other words, what he's saying is there's going to come a time towards the end of time uh, that there will be a coming back together of fathers and children. And, um, and th there's no need for the coming together again unless there's been a division. And, you know, if we look, if we look at what I, I was reading several things, um, again, I, I, uh, I had thought really hard about, uh, continuing the healing. I think God, God wanted a little bit of healing this morning. I thought, I thought a little bit about continuing that, but I just kept hearing fathers. I don't know if it's just because I was looking at a calendar or what, um, but I just kept hearing fathers and, 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 uh, and so it's telling us that that, and I, so I started reading some things, and I read uh, just a short little article that didn't, uh, it wasn't very f fulfilling. But the point was is that is that we live in a day and time where fathers seem to be missing. And again, I know you know you say, well, in this picture and that picture, that you, um, yes, in the world. And I believe also, and what we're going to talk about a lot today are just. Is that is that even the demasculization of of the men, to where 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 fathers become yes men to the mothers. Now I want you to understand this is not we're not taking shots at moms. We love moms. Uh, we 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 thank the world of moms. Um, but moms, 95 percent of the time are there. It's the dads. The dads that. That uh, that seem to do their own thing. It's the men of God 
that uh, that are are. I'll just say it. We are following the pattern of this world, and there's a lot of dads that even though they are even in the house, they're missing. They're not. They're not doing what they need to do. And so, so here in Malachi, it says there's coming a time where dads will become dads again. Children will honor their dads again, and 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 you and uh, it's coming here soon. There is a shift happening. Um, so, so the the point I want to we're going to get out of here today is dads are important. Men of God are important. But they are important in that they need to be, pick up their responsibilities and they need to walk in their responsibilities. If a father's the first one to get born again, uh, 93% of the fa- uh, times the family will follow. If, if the mother is the first one, 17% of the time the family will follow. If the children are the first ones to receive Christ, about 3.5% of the time the family will follow. God calls the dads to be spirit, spirit, spiritual fathers, spiritual uh, uh, leaders, to lead the family. The, the, uh, the only thing I said to Taylor when he came and asked for my daughter's in mar- uh, hand in marriage, I said no, and then walked away. No, the only thing I told him, I said be the spiritual leader. Don't, don't let her be the one that's pulling you. You be the one that gets out in front. And, and leads the family spiritually. Because all the other stuff, you know, personalities are different. Uh, you know, t- t- Taylor is, uh, is is like his daddy, and uh, and he likes his his own his personal time. He likes his quiet time. He likes that. Is that wrong? No, that's just a personality trait. But I don't care if you're quiet. I don't care if you're loud. I don't care if you're. I don't care if you like to get uh, flashy. This morning, I, I, I had one request, and um, I was turned down by at least three of my kids because um, I, I wanted to tag team preach with my kids this morning, and I wanted them to come up and, and, and do some ministry and, and, and go in the area. And I was told um, there, there wasn't a lot of conversation. I'll just say it that way. I was told no and very kind and cons- well, kind of kind and considerate well. Uh, no, Daddy O. Uh, I don't think so. Taylor just walked away, <laughs> and I figured Callie and I we couldn't hold the whole thing up by ourselves. So, um, so I have, all of us have, you know, um, just being up in front of people is not, not not the gig for everybody. But being a spiritual leader is what a dad, what a man of God needs to do, and and. Um, and so, again, I'm not neglecting moms today, but guess what today is? It's Father's Day, so we're going we're gonna to pick on dads. Um, all right, so let's go over to Matthew 3. We're, we're going to start here. I know you say you haven't started already, just only in, in, in words only. <laughs> I started. I know, but this time this, I really mean it. I'm really starting. This time I mean it. In Matthew chapter 3, Jesus is uh, getting baptized. And in the process of this whole thing, um, in verse 17, a, a voice comes from heaven and says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Uh, so, several, <laughs> several years later, uh, uh, a couple years later, in Matthew chapter 17, verse 5. Pause. Uh, at the transfiguration... Uh, while he yet spake, behold, a bright, clou- uh, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a, vo- a voice out of that cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And, and I, you know, uh, I'm going to kind of give you the point of why I, I'm, why I share this. But this, this popped up in me. I think that's every parent's desire. Is to look at their children throughout their life. Look at their children when they're grown and go, this is my beloved son, this is my beloved daughter, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty stinking happy with who they are. I'm really happy with how they've uh, grown up. That, that word well-pleased simply means I take great pleasure in who they are. Um, most of you know that I like sports. 
you don't know, you need to start listening better. Um, but I, I thought I'd tell on myself. Is it okay if I tell on myself a little bit here? Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a dad in every aspect of the term. I just I, I act like a dad. I, um, I I don't. I only have one pair of New Balance shoes, so I don't. I'm not that kind of dad. But um, I don't tuck in my sh- shirts with my shorts. But um, but I, I, I'm absolutely a dad. And so when my kids were playing sports, I did dad things. I just did. And uh, you look back on it. And so I want I want to go ahead. And, uh, it's confession time now. Um, but, uh, when Ryan was in eighth grade, he was in, um, he, the, the Round County middle school football team was last year played football, but they were in the state tournament, first round of the state tournament. They're playing Boyd County here in Round County. And it was a close back and forth game and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and, and what the coach, you know, obviously at that stage, cause most, most offenses aren't set up for throwing the ball far. So there's a lot of running and stuff like that. And that's what most of the game was. It was a really close game. And coming down to the end of the game, um, it was really close. We, we, but we were behind by just a couple points, three or four points. And, um, and we're, we're, we don't have a field goal kicker. So we're, we're marching the ball down the, the, the field. We get down to about the 10-yard line. They call timeout. Uh, we're like, we got to score. Time, literally, time was running out. Uh, and, and they, they said, okay, Ryan, you're going to be the quarterback. So here's Ryan. I don't know if he'd played quarterback hardly at all that game, but when they needed to throw the ball, to throw the ball they put Ryan in at quarterback. He's more accurate, and, and he could throw the ball. So he gets there. Now, now so, so the setup here, time's running out inside of 10 seconds. We're behind by like three or four points. We're in about, right about the 10-yard line, okay? And, and they're coming out of the uh, uh, off the sidelines, and Ryan's quarterback. And all right, now, 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 let's go backwards. We're at Brown County, and and just in case, if you ever, okay, if you ever go to a, a ball game anywhere, sit where you're supposed to sit. Because it's annoying when 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 parents of the opposite sit team sits right in the middle of the home team. And so here we are, we're sitting up there watching the game, and I mean right next to us are the most obnoxious fans I've ever heard in my life from Boyd County. I mean, they are loud, and they are, and they are yelling at our boys, they're yelling at our coaches, they're yelling at everything, they're yelling at the refs, they're just over there, you know, and, 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 and inside of me is going, came here to enjoy the game, and you're ruining it. I, you know, I was, I, was getting, I was getting feisty and upset. I wanted to answer them, but my wife would just look at me. Don't we ain't on answering. It's okay. It's okay. And so, so, so I'm just, this has been the whole game. We're now at the end of the game. I've got a whole, I got three and a half quarters, almost four quarters of pent up anger wanting to throw. I mean, we're at the top of the stands and I just, you know, no one will notice. I'll just shut, chuck them off the backside. Right. And I was, and, and, and long story short, Ryan gets the snap, drops back, throws the ball only where his receiver could, I mean, they had, 25 people in the middle. Of the, I don't know how they had 25 people. And he drilled it right in this place low. The receiver went down, caught it, touched down. We won. And I stood up. And I, I don't know if I've ever said this besides to Jessica, but I stood up and I, and I, I kind of, the, the action was down here, and I was shouting this way and went, that was my boy. That was my boy who threw that pass. My boy threw that pass. Yeah, Jesse, Jesse, and I afterwards I thought maybe I went overboard. That was my boy. That was my beloved son, and who I was extraordinarily pleased with. (laughs) We need to pray for our pastor. Yeah, yeah, because I got grandkids coming now, and I hear they're worse. But as much as I loved it when people would talk to talk to me about my kids and. And talked, you know, I'll, I'll run into people all the time, not literally, but just kind of will pass. Oh, sorry. Hey, your kids. No, I just, I'll just we'll come across people all the time, and they'll sit there and say, "Your kids, oh, we're such great athletes. I love watching your son." There was there was one lady that uh, uh, Ryan went to high school with his granddaughter, and and during the year, during the season that Ryan, his senior season, uh, just before the senior season, his. Um, 
his wife passed away and um and his his went to his daughter who was a teacher at the school um would tell us often that the thing that the, the thing that brings dad joy right now is getting to go to the ball games and watch Ryan play he said he it, it, it's the thing that he he makes sure he got, does every every game he goes there and watches it because it brings him so much joy and I love that I love when they talk to me about my kids and, and they're athletic uh, achievements. But when someone comes up to me and goes, you know, your kids are good kids. They are just good kids. I don't, I, again, I enjoyed all the, I don't want you to throw away all the accolades, but you could end up throwing away all the accolades if all I did in my life was raise two really good kids that people could look at and say they're really good. And, 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 and for me to say, for that, I'm well pleased. And you know, that's one thing that was, uh, the Heavenly Father was saying when he looked at Jesus, is this is my son, and I'm so pleased with him. I'm so overwhelmingly pleased with, pleased with him because it's his meat to do my will. It's his desire to do what I tell him to do. It's his desire. He walks where I've walked. He does what I've told him to do. It, it is my delight that my son, that this is my son. And see, the, the point is that if we're going to raise kids... To be that. Now again, I'm saying I'm sitting here. I, I, we're looking, and we got a lot of grandparents here. We got we got a lot of people be, ready to become grandparents. <sighs> Sheesh. Um, we get we and, and we have, we have some here that are that are. We, we're all still dads. Uh, a lot of us would say that our, our rearing days are you know we're not we're no longer they're not only kids, but this needs to be our mo, our thought pattern in life. Even when the kids are grown, even when they're out of the home, the, uh, is that is that uh, these are my kids and I'm well pleased. But if we're going to do that, then we need dads to stand up and be dads. We need men to stand up and be men. We need to do what the Word of God tells us to do. We need to operate the way the Word of God operates. Because when we're not doing that, men, we are raising a generation who are uh, who are, are who are missing. The uh, m missing that edge, missing that call, missing that that part of their life of what a dad is supposed to do. And again, I'm not I'm not neglecting. I'm not I'm not talking down about moms. Moms have a job, and dads have a job. And as much as I'm grateful for moms who are the only moms in the home and have to do and are thrown into doing both jobs, that's that I I I, I applaud them. I'm grateful for them. But when the dads or when the men of the church, there's sometimes where the dad's not there that the men of the church are let down the kids. Amen. But when the, but, but when the dad is not doing what he needs to do, the kids will will grow up wandering aimlessly and being frustrated. So anyway, I was meditating on this topic as, as a father of, of, of fatherhood. And, and again, the word that came up to me was the, the phrase, my son. I, I, I thought of that one in, in my, you know, my son, whom I'm well pleased. I thought it's a great way to start this. Um, but, but many times in scripture, Different men are recorded as speaking to their sons. The book of Proverbs is full of this. My son, attend to my, you know, my son, listen to my words. It is, it is chock full. I, uh, I think somewhere around 150 different scriptures use that, uh, my son. And I think, uh, I don't know, I would say at least 20 plus times in Proverbs alone, my son. But, but I noticed that a lot of times it was a, a father speaking to a son and saying, my son, and then giving him information. And as it struck me, I thought, God, God, there's nothing put in Scripture on by accident. And so what God wants us to do is to take, take note of these times, what these men are saying to their children, and we need to take and say, that becomes our, our responsibility to do that thing in our lives. And again, I don't think, matter of fact, there's one time, one of them I'm going to bring up, 
was later in life. It wasn't when they were just uh, kids or, or teenagers. You never... I raised my kids so that later in life we could become friends and they'd be people I'd like to hang out with. That's, that's your number one goal. Make them good adults, serve God, and, and, and that you, that you want to hang out with. You know, I, I don't want to hang around my, my child. He's a jerk. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, not the, that's not the child you want to, to, to rape. Yeah, I don't know which one I was talking about, but they don't know either. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, but 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 we, so we never outgrow this responsibility of raising our children. And so today I'm gonna I, I found three and I found three different people that talk about that use that word my son. And I want to I want to talk with you a few minutes uh, this morning uh, regarding this responsibilities of the father is what we're going to call this. These are things that we are responsible for with our children. And, uh, and, and so number one, let's go to Genesis 22. Genesis 22, uh, if you know the scriptures here, this, uh, well, I'll, I'll read the whole thing to you. God has told Abraham to do something that, it, that any father in their right mind would drag their feet to do, and Abraham didn't. <laughs> Amen. But we, we we find out why he didn't. But let's start reading chapter uh, 22, verse 1, Genesis. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt. God does not tempt, test, or try you with things that are bad, but he will test your obedience. He is not going to break your arm to teach you to stay close to him. Trust in me, because I'll break your arm. I'll, I'll wreck your car. Trust in me. But he will say, give. He will say, give big. He will say, witness, share, love. He will say, he'll tell you to do some things that are beyond your ability. And, and, uh, and so it came to pass after these things that God did uh, tempt Abraham's obedience and said unto him, Abraham, he said, here I am. Important words to learn. This is not our message, but important words to learn. How quick are you to obey when God tells you to do something? How much do you drag your feet? And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I tell thee. I've been, I've been annoyed at my son and my daughter at times. Um, I've, I've had to spank them at times. I was upset at them at times. But I've never gotten to that point where I thought it would be like, hey, let's just go up to this mountain here. And uh, we've got, got a mountain now back here. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to offer you up as a burnt offering. Say, say Ryan, go start the bonfire. <laughs> We're toasting sons today. Um, <laughs> and Abra so... Abram thought about it and waited a couple months and a couple, uh, a little while because he thought, this is kind of strange. I don't know how to do this. No. He rose up early in the morning. And, and I, I just want you to see this. Abram, Abraham was not always the 25 years to believe in Isaac. But, but he learned some of those 25 years. So now here we are, you know, years later, God says, I want you to go sacrifice your son as a burnt offering. And he gets up the next morning without a lot of dialogue. Without, was, are you sure about that, Lord? Did I hear you? Well, I tell you what, if it's really you, um, have somebody come up to me and say, boogity boo, you know, because that, that I'll know. That's, that's weird. No one will say that. I'm not saying anybody here's done that. He obeyed. Uh, but he rose up early in the morning and he saddled his donkey. And I still can't say it. I'm sorry. And took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his, his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went to the place that God had told him. And then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes, saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here uh, with the donkeys, and, and, and I and the lad will go up yonder and worship and come again to you. And again, that tells you something a little bit about what Abraham was expecting. 
And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac. Uh, I love it. Yeah, made the son carry the wood that was going to burn him up. That's that's. Uh, and Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son and took the fire in his hand um, and, and a knife, and they both went up together. Verse 7. Here you go. Ready? And Isaac looked to dad and said, Dad, um, I've been with you a lot of times when we do these kind of uh, offering, uh, these kind of uh, sacrifices. And I, I couldn't help but notice something was missing. Can, do you think that perhaps if Abraham was said, yeah, God told me to kill you, that maybe Isaac would always have trust issues with God? <laughs> maybe. Hallelujah. Um, but he starts looking around, and he's like, uh, he's like, Dad, we're missing something. And um, he said, I see the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, here we go. This is a teaching moment. What's he wanting to teach him? Number one, God will provide. Beloved, it is our job as parents to teach our children and, to, and not just teach them, not just with words only, but to show them God will provide. Listen, Abraham, 25 years, he stood. Not all, you know, I, I, like, I like what dad always said about, you know, him in what it was, verse 16, where, where he uh, slept with the handmaiden. And dad's like, well, that's at least a stagger, right? You know. Uh, there's a lot. He staggered all along the way until chapter 17 when he was about 100 years old. And then he staggered not through unbelief and received the receipt, but he stood. He kept standing. He refused to bow. He refused. And guess what Isaac saw? Well, he saw life. Do you think that perhaps there was a time or two where uh, in Isaac's life that he heard that story? God came to me. God, God, God spoke this to me as... You know, uh, you be blessed, blessed. You know, people that bless you will be blessed, and all that kind of stuff. And and he said, he said, he came, told me, he came, here, he promised me you. And he said, twenty five years later, I was a hundred years old. Your mom was ninety. Do you think he? You think Isaac heard that? Heard that God, in an impossible situation, was providing. And so now here's here's <laughs> Abraham. Has no idea how close, how far this thing's going to go. He knows this. God told me to sacrifice my son. So Bubba, carry the wood so I can walk up here. <laughs> and he said, if he doesn't provide before then, we're going to build the fire. If he doesn't provide at that point, we're going to light the fire. If he doesn't provide then, son, you're going to get tied up. If he doesn't provide then, you're going to be laid on the fire and start cooking. You will be, you'll be cut. The blood will flow. If he doesn't, whenever, however long he goes, we're, I'm, I'm in this thing. It tells us here, it says that we're going to come back. So he had already, he already had received the fact that he was going to, that he that God was going to provide. In Hebrews it says that that uh, he already had received him to life again. So in his mind, my son's dead, but he's going to come back to life because he's the promise, he's the blessing that God gave him. And I'm going to show my son, I'm going to show my son how to trust God. I'm going to show my son how to trust God. I am not. I, I am not going to just sit there and say, "No, you, God, God's a good God," and then not do anything. I want Him to see the hand of God move. And He said, and, and, "And here's the point: because if I don't show Him the hand of God moving, then me just telling Him that God will provide is not enough." And so His point here, His point is simple: God will. Provide. How? I don't know. All we know is that he got to the point where he was on the 
He was on the altar. He was ready to roll. He, 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 he had tied him up. And, and I know I couldn't have looked him in the eyes. Especially if I got my knife in the air. I mean, again, do you not think that maybe he always slept with one eye open after that? Put some bells on his, the door of his tent before him and he woke up. Dad, Dad, is that you? No, it's just me, honey. It's just mama. Okay, you can come in. Dad needs, you know. But then God held his hand, held his arm, said, no, 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 no. Look, there's a ram caught in the thicket. And Abraham showed his son that God will provide. And you know what, Isaac, the thing about Isaac's life is it wasn't that spectacular. I know Galatians, Genesis 26 is, is a crazy thing that he just kept living in the blessing of God, living in the, in, in the overflow of God. He had dad's stuff. He had God, dad's blessing. He had dad's, he, all he had to do was open, keep obeying God. Why? Because he learned a long time ago when he was a kid, he learned God will provide. God said, sow in the land. Isaac sowed in the land. Don't go into Egypt. He didn't go into Egypt. Because he learned a long time ago that God will provide. He learned how to trust God with his substance. Isaac saw dad tithe. Isaac saw dad believe God. He saw God. That, that, that literally, when he was 100 years old, he gave birth to his first, his first son. It wasn't his only son. It was his first child. And he had kids after that, popping them out left and right. You know what happens? You know what happens when you, get, when, when you start getting, starting seeing some victories? Those victories seem to come easier. Beloved, I'm telling you this. And I say this, I, I say this every year at, at Mother's Day or Father's Day. Um, we honor all the men of the church. Because as fathers, your kids see you on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's your responsibility to raise them and to show them that God provides. But beloved, I don't care who you are in this room, when, when the kids, even if dad's missing, even if dad doesn't have the testimony, and they can look at Pastor Thad, they look at Pastor Mark, and they, uh, Mike, Mark. They look at Pastor Mike, they look at Pastor Neil, our brother Neil. Highland, I'm just going to call everybody pastor. Amen, amen. Uh, and they look like Randy and Doc. They, they look at all of us. They look at Ryan or Taylor, and they look at them, and they say, these guys are living like, like God will provide. They are giving like God will provide. You see, here, here's the thing, and the Holy Spirit was, was, was showing me this, is that a lot of times we go through life, again, for some reason, I still view myself like it's, it's 30 years old. I recognize I'm not um, closing in on twice that age. I don't look at, I don't, I don't feel old. I don't feel like I just kind of still. And every now and then, God has to, you know, remind me that um, that I'm, I'm it. You know, this is this is the uh, that older generation. I'm that old, I'm part of that older generation. But if we don't teach our kids that God will provide. And therefore, honoring him with our first fruits and our substance and our giving and our, and our tithing. If we don't show them that it works, if we don't show them that it manifests, <coughs> who's going to be responsible for the church five years, ten years down the line? When, when, when those that, that have been responsible are now maybe perhaps uh, living on, on more of the fixed. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not you know, being, we have to raise our kids to be that generation. To carry out the things of God, to carry out the obedient, uh, obey, obeying of God. So dads, we don't tie, we don't give because, uh, uh, Well, 
we don't give. I don't. I don't think you give quite. I don't think that you necessarily have to promote your kids how much you give, but let you let your kids see you give. Let your kids see you tithe. Let your kids see you want to go to. Don't bow bad mouth the church to your kids. Let your kids see you obey. Because we do know what God will do. Abraham knew what God was going to do. And therefore he, he carried out in front of his son. And I, lo- I love that. I love that. He, go to Hebrews real quick. Hebrews uh, 11. I, just, I want you to see this for yourself. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19. It says, Accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence he received him in a figure. You know, what in the world does that mean? He was so confident that God was going to raise him from the dead that before he ever killed him, why do you think he told the men that lad and I will come back? He, he was fully He fully intended on killing that child and he fully intended on God raising him, raising him from the dead. Dads, when we get that full of obedient, obeying God, then our kids can believe us that God will provide. Amen. Uh, Go to Psalm 112. I just want to read the scripture. I've got to kind of, kind of hurry up here. Psalm 112, verse 2. It says, his, his seed shall be mighty on the earth. And that can be the seed you plant. It can be the seed that you put in the field. It can be that. But specifically, it's talking about your kid. And because the, the generation of the upright shall be empowered to prosper. Beloved, if we are doing what we're supposed to do, then we will teach our kids, my son, my daughter, my child, God will provide. Amen? Because our kids will be blessed. Number two, let's go to First, uh, First Chronicles chapter 28. Chronicles, Old Testament. Here's another man who, who learned... Uh, uh, I don't want to say the hard way, but he learned the learned long, long way. Um, he he got, God had a quicker path to the throne, and it didn't quite work out that way, and so he had to keep standing. So he understood um, he understood the, 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 the provision of God. But notice this in 1 Chronicles chapter 28. David's getting ready to, um, uh, to retire, okay, die. He knows his time's coming. He knows his days are, 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 are numbered. And so he's now getting ready because he said, listen, I, I, God, couldn't, God couldn't use me to build the, te- uh, the temple, though that's all I wanted to do for him. Uh, but he's going to use my son. And, he, and, he's, and he's, placed, he's placed my son on the throne. And so I get to now, uh, he said, I don't want my son to be going, well, how do I provide? How do I do this kind of stuff? I want to show him that God will provide. I want to show him that God is, is, is more than able. And so, you know, that in, in, in verse chapter 29, he actually brings the, his offering and then all the men that he raised and that fought with him brought their offerings and just and with more than enough for the building of, of, the, uh, of that temple, Solomon's temple. Um, but in chapter 28, he, he speaks to the people of Israel and then he, tr- he turns in verse 9 and, and, and approaches his son and talks to his son and gives his son a charge. And, and notice what he says in verse, verse 9. He says, and now Solomon, my son. And then he gives him four important things. Know the God of thy father. Don't just read about him. Just don't memorize the stories. Don't just, uh, you know, I can, I, can, I can pass a trivia quiz. Anybody ever go on, you know, see any of those things on, online? And, and they go, here's the easy ones. Here's the medium ones. Here's the hard ones. And here's one really hard. And you're going, I, I knew that when I was five years old. You know, I, that, that's not that hard. How is that hard for people? That's not knowing God. Knowing God is experiencing Him. It's living for Him. It's walking with knowing His voice. 
But he says, my son, know the God of thy father. Serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understandeth the imaginations and thoughts. And if thou seek him, he will be, he will be found of thee. But if you forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. And he goes on, he talks to them, but I was, I just, I just read right there that, that phrase, my son. He looks to Solomon in front of in front of all of Israel, and he says, My son, listen to these words. Know the Lord God of your father. Know the one who who gave me victory over over the, the Goliath, over the enemies. Know the one that I worshipped in the middle of the shepherd field. Know the one that I danced before the ark with all my might. Know the one who delivered me. Know the one who placed me, who called me, who, who put me in this position. Know him. Know the one who, who allowed me to have a second generation on the throne. Saul didn't get a second generation on the throne. But know the God of your father. I say this and I say this because, beloved, it is your job as men. Don't leave your family at home. Don't leave your kids at home. I'm going I'm to hit with this in just a second a little bit more. You show them. You lead them. They have to make a decision. But dad, my, our dad would always say, he would say, you're, you'll, you're going, you're, you'll go to hell over my body, over me. You'll have to go through me to get there because I'm not letting you go. So he's got three kids that serve God. One can say she served God all of her life. The, re, the other two were still plowing away. But my dad refused to let us kids I don't ever remember a time. I remember, I remember the first time ever that I got to watch um, a Super Bowl in, in its entirety because it's always on Sundays. And we had church on Sunday nights. And, 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 and I, I, got, I, I remember watching one, and I felt so dirty, so disgusting the whole time. But he said, he said Solomon, know the God that I serve. And, and, and he went on and said, and serve him. Don't just know him, but serve him. Walk with him. Obey him. If he says something, you do it. And again, I love to preface that by going back to the wedding, uh, wedding uh, at, at Cana, where, Cana of Galilee, where, where his mama said, looked to the servants and said, listen to the words of his mouth, and whatever he tells you to do, you do it. That's serving him. Beloved, I recognize that we are not servants, we are children. But as children, we need to choose to serve our Father. To honor Him with our lives. To honor Him with all that we have. To honor Him with our ears. Serve Him with a perfect heart. That word perfect simply means a whole heart. When I read that word whole heart, it, it immediately made me think of integrity. And, and, and again, there's so many things that you can simply insert there, but, but dads, it's your, it's your job to teach your kids integrity. Don't let them see you cheat. Don't let them see you cut corners. My dad, he would look at me. I don't know if he ever had this conversation with his daughters, but he would look at me and he'd say, he'd say, Thad, a man is only as good as his word. You become a person that people can't trust you, you're not worth anything anymore. I think I shared that with Ryan at least a couple times. You're only as good as your word. So with a perfect heart, clean before him, clean before man. It tells us in scripture that, 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 that man won't, you know, men, men couldn't even bring up anything against Jesus.
and with a willing mind. And I'll insert this again here. Beloved, don't be a, don't be a dragging your feet Christian because your children see that. And if it's a burden to you, it'll be an absent thing for them. I want to say that again. If serving God is not willing to you, if it's a burden to you, then it will become an absent thing to them. If you're going home talking against your pastor, you're going home and sharing all the, all the things that are wrong with the church and all the things and go, yeah, but we got to go. It's the best, you know, it's the best one we've come across so far. If you're doing that, then your children, don't be surprised when your children don't want to go at all. Be the spiritual leader. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4. It says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now most fathers, because again, all the kids remind them of that. Don't provoke your children to wrath, Dad. And so that is one of the main reasons why the men of God have become so pansy. Is because we don't want to provoke our kids. Oh, you know, he's, he's, he's a teenager now. So if he wants to stay home, I'll let him stay home. No, our family goes to church. Get, get your coat on, we're going to church. But our friends, we're going to go hang out. Go to church, then go hang out with You, we sit there and we go, I don't want to provoke them. Well, do you know what these nurture and admonition means? Nurture means instruction, correction, and discipline. Admonition means mild rebuke or warning. So us sitting around watching our kids go to hell is not raising them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I remember, I remember being down in in Texas. I remember the early, when, when we would go over to the, the conferences over there, I remember getting home at, kids, do you remember getting home at 11 or 12 o'clock at night and then getting up in the morning and going to, uh, going to school? But our kids don't function well in the morning. Well, good confession. Keep your confession up. It's getting you along. You know what's getting you? It's getting your kids not functioning well in the morning. Our kids went to church and when, we, and, and when we had a chance to go out for free food afterwards, we went out for free food afterwards. Trust me, we did. When we got home late, we got home late. When the kids fell asleep, we carried them in. Or when they got big enough, we threw them in a wagon. No, we just let them sit in the car. No, we woke them up and said, get inside. And they went inside. And when it was time to get up, we all got up. Nurture and admission, not provoking. It's funny, it's in the same script. Don't provoke them, but warn them. Caution them. Amen? And let's go to the last one here. Proverbs 4. Do you think maybe this is one that I'd throw in here? And again, Proverbs is full of this, but I thought this is just a great one for us to, to finish up on here. Our job. I loved it. A couple years ago when I when we had our covenant relationship. No, it was family month. October was family month. And and uh, my first message on family was that it's our God God has called it our main objective is to raise the next generation of covenant. And I love the wording of that because that's so important. That's what we're doing. So the third way, if we're going to raise our kids the way we need to raise them and be men, that, men of God that we're created to be, uh, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20. My son, there it is, attend to my ears, incline thine ears to my sayings. Let them not depart from mine eyes, keep them in the midst of thy heart. Now, again, I think first of all, we could say that this just means, hey, dads, make sure your kids listen to you. Slap them upside the head. Just no, I'm not going to make sure your kids listen to you. But see, I think this is going deeper than just 
us, our kids listening to us. It's us speaking the word of God to them, teaching them. I don't know how many times I was thinking about this today, and 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 I feel like there was probably times where my kids would we'd sit down for some kind of talk or some kind of thing, and Dad would always bring God into it. We'd always bring some story into it, some Bible. Well, and the Dad, what are you bringing this you know Bible into it? Because that's my job. Incline thine ears to my saying. Hear what I'm saying. <clears throat> because if we will learn to do that, dads. And according to, according to Proverbs 13, 1, it says, a wise son listens. So if, if we have nothing to say, Ryan was in a frustrating point. I know I'm just picking on Ryan here because he's my son, and that's the name of this message, my son. And I remember there was a, there was a period of time that he was in kind of frustration um, in, in college. And I, I, so I would, I'd use my little Photoshop skills and I'd put him, I'd put a picture of him on it and then I'd put some scripture on it of greater seed than is in me or what, um, what was the one Philippians, you know, was, where I, I, I could do all things through Christ. And I put that on and I, and I, I, I shoot him a text message with it. I don't know if he deleted that right away. I don't know if he had just, it, it, I don't know if he still has it. I don't know. But but all I wanted my son to understand was, you, you, you can do this thing. The God that you serve is greater than the situation you find yourself in. Amen. And so I used, I used those words. I used, but you're a pastor, and I'm a dad. Do you ever find? Do you ever realize there's only a, a, a couple people in this in this uh, church that don't call me pastor? Well, obviously the unruly ones, the, the ones that just don't want to. Um, but even Jessica, when she's talking to you guys, will say, Pastor, Pastor this, Pastor that, this, this, this. When she talks to me, she calls me, hey, you. But those those two little rugrats right back there, what do they call me? Dad. Pastor Dad. The Honorable Reverend Dad is what I prefer, but... But see, a, 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 a dad who teaches their kids the word, don't just leave it up to the, the we, pastor, uh, I guess we, we could probably call her this, pa, uh, uh, Jessica Ellsworth does a great job with her kids. But Jesse and I were talking about it and how, how often so many of, uh, of the ladies that, are, that, that help back there uh, get, get overtaken by chaos. And Jessica Ellswick is like, bring it on! Just, but she's a great teacher. We got teachers on Wednesday nights that are great teachers. But do not leave it in their hands. Ask them, you know, what did you learn today? What did you talk? Talk to them about it. And sons, kids, listen to your parents. I want to. I want to close with this this uh, illustration. I thought of a couple of them. I told on myself earlier. I'll kind of tell you on myself again. But I remember as a kid, uh, my dad had put a uh, basketball hoop up in our, our driveway. It was never quite 10 foot, almost 10 foot, um, which was fun for my friends when we go over and they just slam on it and destroy it. But um, my dad would get me out there as just a little kid and and I'd sit there and I'd do as every kid does. I'd take both my hands and shoot it and it'd miss. And my dad would say, Dad, listen, you have to shoot with one hand. And dad would just do that and he'd decent little shot. And, he's, and I'd go, Dad, I can't do that. I, <laughs> and dad, dad would say, Dad, listen, you have to shoot with one hand. You can't shoot with two hands. You have this hand, that hand over there, your left hand, it's just for balance. Don't shoot with it. Don't. Ah, yeah, and I'd miss again. And I was so frustrated. Now later in life, and I never, I never figured that out. I was, I was, you know, I played basketball as a slasher, a cutter, a layer upper. That was all I did. Later in life, I learned. I taught myself. You know what I learned? To use one hand. So fast forward ahead. I have a son whose first word he spoke 
was ball. So I said, cha-ching. And I was, I was like, yeah. And so I'd get him out, and we'd get, we'd get to the basketball hoop. And guess what? I, first thing I'd tell him, I'd say, shoot with one hand. And uh, long story short, is I kept telling him, listen, I, I, I'd stand out at three point range, I'd hit it, I'd shoot three lines, I'd hit, I'd hit it. He'd watch me and he'd go, okay, dad knows something. So he started shooting with hand, one hand. There was one time when he was in fourth grade that he was he was in practice, and he was he was out past the three point range, and he was he was going down where his butt touched the ground and just chucking it from three point range. Just, and I came into him afterwards. I said, "What was that?" He said, "That's the only way I can shoot from way down there." And I said, "Then you don't need to be shooting from way down there." I said, "Shoot, one hand." Here's what I'm trying to say. I didn't receive the correction of my dad, so I was known for breaking backboards. Ryan listened to his dad, therefore he was known for breaking records. Be the dad that gives the correct, gives the word of God, gives the teaching that your children need so that they can be the people who grow up to not just be people that make you well pleased, but that succeed in life. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's let's stand together. And again, I know I, I referenced dads a lot because that was the kind of the context of what I was, I was talking in here. Moms, be the be be the people that that love like you know moms. And again, I think we're kind of past this in a lot of areas. Uh, most people. Be that per, per, be that lady that allows the, the the dad to be the dad. Don't be the one that's just that's just quick with the uh, I got this. You just stay there. Let, you know, let let the dad be the dad. But beloved, when we're raising our kids, our our goal is, and again, I'll, I'll just put this out here again. Always be teaching them, showing them God will provide. Show them to know Him, to serve Him to have that perfect heart for him and the willing heart towards him and then be diligent with the word of God. Show them the word. Teach them the word so that they can walk it out. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. And Lord, I understand and I recognize that so much of who we are here is, is we've got grandmas and grandpas. we got we got uh, we got people who have, have already raised their kids. They're already on their own. They're already out there in this world. And, and sometimes we can feel maybe I missed it. Maybe I, let's see, maybe the lesson that your child needs to hear is, is that I, I was a mess. And look what God did to me. I was not, I, I was not right. And look what God did to me. Maybe that's the lesson they need to learn. But we never are to get past the point of revealing to our children, if you will be obedient, if you will do what the Bible says to do, even when it's tough, God will surprise, God will provide. As especially as they're getting ready, Solomon was ready to step into that new level of life, that new that new arena of life, and his dad, dad said, "Don't don't be a person that doesn't know God. Know Him. Know the God of your father." Uh, walk with him, serve him, live live for that, that, that God. Be the one that is constantly encouraging those around you. Be in the to be the men that God, the, the children that God needs them to be. Always be the encourager. Always be the edifier. <clears throat> so we can raise kids that are on fire for God. And Father, let us be those that always have the word hidden in our heart. Not just so that we won't sin against you, but so that our generations that follow us will stand strong in that relationship. We love you, Dad. We do have the best dad in the whole world. And we thank you, Father, that you are raising up fathers to be the men of God. You've called us to be. We love you, Dad, in Jesus' name.